And then uh, I'm, I'm going to give a presentation called Researcher, Facilitator, Co-Creator. And I'll use many more short words. But let me warn you immediately. For none of these words, we have good definitions. So I will talk around things and hope to make things clear by putting things together. And what I put together is mainly the things I'm struggling with myself over the last 10 years, when we've been introducing participatory design techniques in a large design school in an industrial uh, engineering setting. Um, so let me tell you where I come from. I come from Delft. This is the picture from the brochure of our school, the School of Industrial Design Engineering. This is something from the inside, so it looks like a design school. And this is a bit about the statistics, and that may help a bit. The school is started in 65, and is one of the biggest design schools at the university level in the world, I think, if not the biggest. We have 2, 000, over 2,000 students running about the place on design alone. Um, we have bachelor, master and PhD programs and about 200 staff. Usually, as you compare with other, other design schools, we're rather oversized, you might think. The school started on product design. And I think that showed that, that until 2000, the main focus was really on tangible things and, and how to deal with that. Like most uh, industrial design educations, focusing on the products. Uh, from the beginning, however, Delft has taken an, an integrative approach, including not only the aesthetics, the aesthetics side, uh, but also in the technology side, well, we're the University of Technology, so there's a lot of technology around. But also human factors and business side. And that integration um, proved very valuable over the years. However, since 2003, then we started to teach in English, and we found that more specialization was needed, and we kept the bachelor program the first three years in this format, and we made three different master programs uh, in which students specialize. You already see that in, in one former five-year track, we now find in-house that we have three different types of designers. Ones that focus on company and strategy, ones that focus on user, user experience and interaction, and ones that focus on the traditional elements of traditional uh, technology integration, the aesthetics of shape, detailing and embodiment. Um, also, luckily since then, we started to teach in English. So now we have about 20% international students from all over the world, which greatly uh, enhanced the picture. So here's some examples. Well, that's, that is, I have, like Alistair said this morning, you don't have to write everything down because I'm going to leave my sheets uh, for, for the website, and so sometimes I can skip over something because I also have too many slides. But so the strategy people focus on co-branding, for instance. So how does a coffee company go with a Campina, which makes uh, dairy products? Or how does Philips uh, go with Heineken to make uh, beer dispensers? Uh, wonderful program which got a national award was a way to get grandma on the family web blog without having to learn to use a computer. Um, and then on the technology integration, the hydrogen power of scooter, classical thing you'd see from a technology university. I'm also from ID Studio Lab, it says here, and says down there. And that's in our school, that's 10 years ago we started to realize as researchers and teachers, we should be working like designers. And we used to be little rooms, little rooms, little rooms with researchers in it. And I think a large group of us joined in a studio atmosphere. And that promote, greatly promoted crossovers. Because although our researchers have backgrounds from many different areas, we have psychologists and sociologists, and we have people hardcore technology, and 
since about 2000, we have an increasing number of researchers who have a background in design. And I have a background myself in physics, but if I were young now, I'd rather have had a background in design. I think it's, it's really an important asset in research to have a background in design, to have an integrative understanding of problems versus solutions, which my classical scientific education didn't give me. Um, because I have too many slides, let me tell you the bottom line of the end. What I want to explain from my experience is how difficult it is to talk about design and about doing design and about the profession of designer. Is it a profession for which you need an education and a diploma or is it a role? Is it a part you play in the whole thing? The same thing is designers their job is changing. They have to do many more things these days than in the past. Or at least some of them have to do many more things. Uh, and finally, and you have heard more things like users are also taking on different roles. Like with fab labs, like with making, like with activism. Um, life isn't simple anymore. I'm not going to give you new words for this, but I'm going to point out how difficult the words we have are. I'll get back to that. Um, I didn't think of this all by myself, and what I'm going to tell tomorrow is especially uh, supported by uh, discussions I've had over the past 10 years with Liz Sanders, who probably anyone who knows the participatory design area knows Liz Sanders of Make Tools and earlier work with Liz, I've been working uh, on a book on participatory design techniques and yes, you can buy it after the summer. Uh, Frankie Sveswijk Visser is our first PhD in contact mapping, ways of involving people to, as experts of their experience to talk about their lives so designers are informed. You can download her PhD for free. Uh, Daniel Sarkis on the other hand, is, I think, one of our technologists, really maker, activist makers, PhDs. Both of these have a design background and are active in research. And his PhD can be downloaded. And it's about shape expression. Um, I'll be referring to discussions I've had with him on the role of designers in this open design activity, in this making community. Um, and both of us have been in the open design book, so there's something you can find back. Let me start with a very awkward old picture. I'll return to this picture all the time. The classic idea of what a designer does and how jobs and roles were divided. And here we have the designer. There we have a client or manufacturer, and there is the user. And the traditional idea Designer is the guy who gets a brief from the manufacturer. Please make us a new flower pot, or please make us a new kitchen uh, utensil that has to cut this and has to be striped like that, etc. Full specification, hands back the design, and actually the manufacturer or client does has contact with the user or consumer or the customer who gets to buy the thing against money. Yes, I know this is a simplification, but I'm going to show it anyway because it helps. It's A, it's the offset, and B, it's still the image that most people have in the back of their heads. Those separate roles. Um, I think there are big changes, and I'll walk you through the rest of this diagram uh, later. So, the changes. Let me first talk about the user side. Um, three things happening, users not just being uh, someone who takes a product and uses it uh, without any criticism, but actually people who can ha also have making abilities, um, we talked about that uh, today. The second is users taking part in 
uh, product development processes run by companies. And third is, who are we talking about? And I'll get to that. If you talk first, I'm not going to say very much about that. There's lots of people saying things about that here. Is the making uh, user, the user who um, is with instructables, fab labs, etc., is now getting empowered to create things which they couldn't do before. And that has been going on for centuries, of course. We've had knitting patterns <coughs> being spread out half a century ago, probably a century ago, but now it's moving into the highly technological realms too. Um, second is the participating user. And there I've seen a change uh, in design education. Uh, in our school, when I came in in 85, designing for users was already well established. So the user-centered design, the value for the user is something which is really important, was already established then. But many people were quite critical about any inputs that users could have in that. In the past 10 years, we've been working very much in techniques of bringing users in under the motto that the user is the expert of his experience. It's not necessary that the user will take over the design, but the user knows things which the designer, especially designers hired by big companies, do not about the user. Um, so most of the things in these processes, I'm talking about users participating, it's still that there are professional designers involved in this. Um, if you look at how big companies uh, involve users, it's actually moving from the back to the front. If you want to make a joke, I'd say, originally, only the complaints department knew most about the users, and then they found out, well, the sales department would find out, and advertising would find out from people how they could be lured into buying stuff. And then we get into the, the later phases, usability testing. It's great if you have a company and have a product and it can have mistakes in it to find out those mistakes before you try to sell things. That's 1980s. And then you get idea generation, understanding what the user needs, situation, etc. are. That's of the last 10 years. And that's growing quite rapidly. When I have to tell this to people in industry who are not used to much of the design speak, but know the terms of market pool and technology push, the classical idea is companies like Philips, electronics companies, they hire, they have actually a lot of intelligent people, they think of new tricks, you put the trick in a box and try to sell it, technology push. If you happen to manufacture mobile phones, and the competition is putting cameras in it, people will start to ask for it, market pool. What's now happening actually also is that understanding the users is being recognized by companies as an independent force for creating new opportunities. And they're starting to realize that they have to uh, understand their users. When Philips looks at its stores, or at its uh, complaints department, they get some products back, which people bought, and bring back because this is defective. And then they get the refund, etc. And it goes to the labs, and they say, what was actually wrong with it? And the shocking finding is, 85% of the returns were technically perfect. So, if in 85% of these cases people bought it and could not find out how it worked, its design must have been pretty bad. So, plenty of opportunity to learn. So, in learning about uh, people, uh, we've been working on a systematic approach uh, to help designers. And a lot of the ethnographic and participatory techniques uh, I'll show you a few of them, uh, to, in a design process, 
give this in, bring this insight in ways designers can use. For instance, you have a panel of, of participating users and you give them handout cameras with little instructions. Uh, this was for an insurance company. Uh, the participants were restaurant owners and we asked them, what do you hate to do most? Well, what this gentleman hates to do most is working through his to-do lists. And he brings a photograph and actually you learn a lot of it. This gentleman runs a big restaurant. He does not use Excel. He actually uses a mess of little papers. Things you ought to know if you want to design something for these people. Other things are you give people diaries, open-ended diaries, with express the things you did in a day. And this was for a shoe uh, company uh, wanting to understand how people thought about shoe care and know things. And we just asked participants, okay, describe the things you do in a day and describe them the moments you felt good and bad and then describe why. And what you do then is you ask people to observe a part of their life and to reflect on it. And that gives um, insights and stories which you hadn't had before. There are ways to help them be more effective at this. And some of the ways are toolkits, as Liz Saunders calls them. And Instead of just asking, here's a blank book, write down some of your thoughts, we tell them, here's a toolkit, it should help you express things about this matter. And then we give them about a hundred ambiguous words. Words like, too late, happy, calm, fast, and similarly, ambiguous images. And we ask, make a big picture expressing this. And then people start making and they make expressive artifacts. And the interesting thing is, a lot of designers were very skeptical about that. Hey, asking people to make collages, that's our job. Users cannot make collages. You have to have a design diploma for that, or at least a year's training. But actually people can make very things that you may or may not think they are pretty, but the interesting thing is when they've made something, they have a story to tell. A display like this is not just an externalization of an idea, it forced them to think of, why did I pick this picture? And because all the pictures are ambiguous and all the words are ambiguous, it's not offensive to ask them, could you explain why you pick, took this picture? I so said, I took that picture because my aunt always tells me that such and such, and in order to do that, I have to do that. And everything that follows the because is interesting. You can make toolkits for specialized purposes. This for Vodafone, uh, for people's relational networks, and then you supply them with circles and stickers representing people and ask them, who are the people you talk to most often or communicate? or keep in touch with. Um, if you ask that just straight at someone, it's, oh, who I talk to, um, my wife maybe, or something like that. If you give them the tools to express and sometimes to think, you're surprised how much uh, richness comes out of that. Also part of the things we had to learn were techniques like uh, facilitation and hosting discussions here you have four men discussing in an over three hour session about how they experienced shaving in the morning. And we developed a number of techniques that help people to express themselves easier. In a group, some people are more shy than others and are not easily express themselves. But if you put them behind a circular or rectangular object which says TV, suddenly it's much easier to give your opinion. 
And then you can dive into the psychology of that. And the psychology of that is, when you're on TV, of course you're an expert. Experts are always interviewed on TV. Second thing is, you can say something back. It hurts nobody if you criticize their ideas. It hurts nobody if you speak back to the television. When we tried that in Asia, it was actually the only way to get people to talk. All the other more regular discussion techniques didn't work at all. But when we asked people to tell about the things they had been thinking about earlier, and to make one point on a television, it became a sort of tell-sell television, with people trying to really advocate their opinions, and the other people suddenly trying to react on that, and say, no, I don't think that at all, etc. Whereas, if you do it without the television frame, it is very impolite to criticize or disagree with someone expressing an opinion. So, some of these techniques, which are not sketching on a piece of paper, which are not building a prototype, have become regular ingredients in our master education. Are these techniques from ethnography? Are these techniques from psychology? Are they from sociology? Somewhere in between, a mix and a bunch. And it's always tuned in a way that it becomes interesting for designers to do, because our students love to make these toolkits. And it takes considerable skill to make a toolkit that is inviting for people, because if you put too much aesthetics in it, and that's the, the danger of people with a design education, that they put too much aesthetics in it, people cannot use it to make their own story. So you actually have to systematically randomize your aesthetics, which is an interesting craft in itself. Miss Sandos developed Velcro modeling kits to help people create dream products. You don't start with that. You first have them talk about considerations. Then you ask somebody, OK, we've been talking for two hours about these aspects. Could you make a dream product in this area? And just stick together a few pieces of Velcro. And yes, it can never become a beautiful product. But the interesting thing is, she said, I did a study with, uh, for Microsoft for Xbox game controllers made by fathers and sons who are into those games. And in 10 minutes, these father-son teams had made three different designs for a game controller, each with 12 or, or six little beads indicating functions and buttons. And for each bead or button, they had a reason. In 10 minutes, three designs of six components, each with an argued reason. So there you have a load of information by which you can try to see what's important for these people. And there again, you have to step above the level of Oh, the views have made a design. I'm going to copy it. I'm going to sketch it out. That's not the idea. Even further, uh, this is from Ina Rabos, uh, who we ran into half a year ago. And that was a big shock for me, because I thought, these are these great techniques that we've been teaching designers. And here's people in a hospital doing them themselves without any training. Um, Ina is a scrub nurse and plays an important part in the redesign of the operation theatres in a big hospital. And it's a classic example of participatory design, where some of the people who were in the field looked carefully at what the architects were coming with and said, this is not going to work. But the architects spoke to the bosses up in the company and usually there the decisions are made, and then later and later and later and later it comes to the work floor. But she managed to mobilize and actually convince the management to be involved in this. And she developed entire toolkits and involved, I think, over 600 participants, from surgeons to scrub nurses 
to anesthesiologists, to technicians, to cleaning staff, to nurses. She said, next time we should take the patients also. And that greatly changed the design of the operation theater. This is something else. This Saunders worked for two years, four years with an architecture company in the US. Uh, and here she had nurses uh, designing uh, patient rooms. And these are three nurses from different floors and they'd never spoken to each, each other before, but very quickly, when given the right tools, they would come up and discuss between each other. And this is the discussions you want. And also you want to see what they do. And one of the interesting patterns there is they always start putting the television, the clock, in bed. Everything else is secondary. Because those three things are most important for the patient. So here's some real experts on the design that you involve. And the interesting thing again here is the level of aesthetics is open enough that the participants can work with it. Also spent quite some time on you involve many people, dozens of them sometimes, carefully write down everything they say, and then you have to go through how do I make this into a whole? And is this supposed to be scientific findings or just practical findings? And I see we operate on the whole spectrum there. Fraki especially concentrated then on the situation in big companies where the research Findings are, can be made, because usually they have budget to conduct these studies, but they don't have the design teams at the same time as the research. And what we optimally want is to involve the design teams, that's both technologists and the designers, as we would call them, uh, in these studies and let them talk with the users and let them find out what these things are. Many big companies are so strictly organized in their processes that they don't have an existing design team until the earlier phase is finished. A few principles that we learned. One of it is that the type of information you can gain from people is often underwater. There's explicit information, what they can tell, uh, observable information, what you can see that they do, and then there's their expertise. And it's, they don't often talk about it. The nurses don't spend their time talking about how to arrange a patient room, because that's not what they do in their job. But they have a lot of expertise, and the tools help to get underwater. Don't confuse this with most consumer research done with companies. Usually, they ask you a question. How many cars do you own? Would you like to have an 8 megapixel camera on your phone? Yes or no? The thing is, they only want your answers. But what we think is more important, we want their questions. We want to find out what our blind spots are in the expertise of the users. Bas van Eindhoven told me a wonderful thing. He works for a, a consultancy in the building industry and was involved in the, in the hospital building project. And he says, the architects come to the doctors and ask them to, with the proposed design for a part of the hospital, and they ask them, could you sign it, because we need your consent. And the doctors are awkward. They used to be forced, but they want to understand, and they can't read maps. Can you read maps? Plans, sorry. I can't. So what he did, actually, he went to the architects and showed them an x-ray photo. And he asked the architect, can you tell me what's wrong with this patient? And then he let an awkward silence fall. 
And the architect got irritated and said, of course I can't. Well, the doctor that you were just asking for his signature can look at this photo and tell you what's wrong with the patient, what needs to be done, how many days it takes, and how much money it takes. And you can tell that in 30 seconds. You can't. And vice versa. And one of the problems there is how to communicate and how to bring in people's expertises. You have to make the translation between the design languages and the user expertises. The techniques to go underwater are generative sessions and generative techniques are the tools that we show. And life is complex. I'm just going to make two remarks about this. It used to be that all people thought of as research was this. Classic science-inspired human factors. Usability testing. You have a new product, put it in the lab, ask someone, try and shave your beard with this. And you study him and see if he cuts himself or if he's unhappy or if he manages. That is, you treat him like a laboratory rat. It's the bottom left corner. Now, the roles of users have spread on one side in the direction where users are seen not as an object of study, but as an active participant. So that's one dimension. And the other dimension is how the research techniques are changing. The tools I showed were tools for visioning futures, tools for probing contrasts, integrating incompatible dimensions. Hey, those are design tools. So design tools are entering the world of research. A basic thing that many designers need to be convinced of, and many people need to be convinced of, actually, is that all people are creative, as Liz would phrase it. And in our book, we distinguish four levels. Everybody, actually, is creative. And a lot of people are quite happy about some of the mundane things they do. Just folding the laundry, or oh, oh, organizing your herbs and spices in your kitchen, is experienced as a creative act. I'm pressing the wrong button again. Sorry. Um, then there are several levels of changing, of bringing new things in the world. And it's important to realize that not only this thing at the bottom, which we uh, real which we associate so much with the designer's godly creativity is what creativity entails. But all these earlier phases are present in people's actions and they take part in the processes. Another thing is um, how to get at, how to get people to talk about values. One of the things from the, the daily timeline exercise is that you don't start to ask about values. You start by taking an empty timeline. This is your day. Could you fill in the things that you did? And then you can layer one. Just facts. I dozed, I got up, I waited, I went to bed. When they've completed that layer, you ask them, tell me when it was good and when it was bad. And then they will add a few. And after that, you ask them, could you give reasons for that? Now, a lot of classical research techniques actually try to drill an oil well from one moment immediately down there. It's very, very difficult. If you said, when, when the word, I stayed in bed reading a book, why was that good for you? Oh, well, 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 well. But once you see the whole spectrum, you can compare the different things. Comparing is a great way to deepen your insight. Another thing is, if you want people to talk about the future, you have to explore the aspects that you talk about with them. So we start at the now by people observing what, how they did things this week or last week, and they observe themselves. 
and that helps them understand what we want to learn. Then we ask them, go back to your memories. When was something like this really good? And when was it really bad? And if you have these really good and really bad, then they can tell you why it's. And then you go down to the level of values. And these whys will probably hold in the future. So then you start to think about what might contribute to these whys that you'd like to have. So this goal is the path of expression. It's impossible to start immediately. So when people criticize participatory design for you can't just ask people what they want, they don't know what they want. No. That takes awareness. That takes reflection. It takes a process. But you can help that process. One way of helping it is knowing and treating your users with respect. This is from the hospital study. It turns out that there's 12 people with different expertises. You need to involve them. But these people work their tails off. You can't get them to a two-hour interview session. So what they did is they hung up quick questionnaires on the walls between the operation theatre and the scrub down. And then they would find some moment in between. And actually that provided a good source of information too. So you have to adjust your research methods to the experts. Companies are starting to realize it. And actually, one of the interesting things is the participants themselves benefit a lot of it. And this was a big surprise for me. We had people participating in the study, in a graduation project of a student, and they, uh, they took part, and they gave some insights, and actually told them back what we learned, and they said, thank you very much, nice. And then after half a year when the student had finished his design and made his prototypes, he wanted to do some testing and said, let's try taking the original people. And it turned out that those original people knew most of what they had learned in that one afternoon session. Many of them actually knew more because they had learned things about their own values, learned things about what they needed, what they wanted. And actually sometimes they learn things about how they can be influential. In his book, Better, Atul Gawande, American uh, surgeon, talks about a study, a disciplinary design study done in the hospital uh, about washing your hands and how it's terribly important in order not to have people get ill in hospitals. Um, and the interesting thing is that in the, in, the, in the book, they say, after 17 sessions with users, we didn't find out any new ideas. But we continued till 40 sessions, because we found out something else was happening. These people were starting to understand that they could actually say meaningful things, that they knew things about how their environment could be improved. And actually, two weeks after a session, we noticed that the nurses were giving instructions to the staff to hang the soap dispensers at another position, where it was more effective. So who's doing the design here? Who's creating the solutions here? Was this just research as knowledge creation, or are we already changing the world? As I said, life is complex. Who are these users? Um, that's just a minor point, but we, we run into that if you looked at designers 20 years ago, we were all looking at the product. There was enough problems in the product. I mean, there's technical functionality, and there's a lot of technology in it, and, and stuff, and then manufacturability, enough. And then you can produce your products and look at a catalog of products. It contains products, usually in empty space. The products are rarely used in empty space. They usually function in people's lives. 
and how they function in people's lives is actually quite complex. The people you need to involve, these experts, are not just the person who's the primary recipient. We find out that if it's about care for the elderly, the nurses, they're not the person who pays for the service, but they're very knowledgeable. If you look at, uh, this is a study for getting young people into museums, and the interactions that these guys have among themselves proved to be the key understanding for designing a product that would fit them. Understanding one of them is not enough. They function is sort of like a team because one was more leader-like and the other is more counter-agent and the third one is more the peacemaker in between and that seemed, turned out to be a traditional pattern at this age. And so understanding one user is just too simple. We may know that, but we very often fail to find. Another study about uh, young children's care and bottle feeding turned out that the young fathers find great value in being able to play a part in this. And that can be an important thing if you want to create a service or a product to function in that area, not to focus on the kid or the mother alone. Helma van Rijn designed toys to have autistic children learn words. Very, very difficult research subject because it's very, very difficult to understand the world of an autistic child. The mothers and caregivers who work with these children on a daily basis were great informants, but also she found they are actually the users of the products you make. Because what her toy does is whenever you touch these blocks, the name of the object, like truck, would be pronounced. One thing I didn't know about autistic children was that from the voice that pronounces it, they're able, or this kid, was able to tell the gender, but not the individual person. Aha! So that might make life cheaper. You can, you can have one voice speak it for all these children. They don't recognize whether it's their parents speaking it or whether someone else is speaking it. But if you realize that these kids in, at this age live under constant supervision, you realize that this kid is moving these blocks together and it loves to do that. So this word is being spoken hundreds of times a day what are you doing to these parents who are around? Which voice would they prefer? One of their own or one from television? Becomes a consideration. The roles are more complex. Now here's what I show my students as a warning against words. And this particularly the word user, you see him here. And each of these words has been used and proposed, and each of them is wrong. With my students, I take half an hour of this. I only give you a few seconds, and you can see it later on the website. But it's one of the big problems we have is we have no words will not help us. They're usually too abstract. The user is not someone who is touching the buttons, and the only one I really like is the victim of our designs. And that's maybe because it's always good for a laugh. Um, but one of the things I think this morning was also a positive intention, but realize one thing, if you design a lock, it's not just the child you're designing for. You're actually thinking a lot about the thief. He's not a beneficiary if you're designing a good lock. So life is complex. Finally, where designers are going, and now I'm going to speed up because I've actually told a lot about the things that's happening with users and it affects the designers. When I came to the university in Delft in 85, I noticed there was a lot of dealing with the star designers. Dieter Rams, Colani, 
Charles Knight's more contemporary example that followed the idea. It took me a few years to realize that actually the industrial design is a very uh, anonymous profession and not many people get famous. Anyone know these people? They're actually graduates from our school, but they are design managers. Actually, you might see him somewhere in the Netherlands. He's getting a bit famous. He's the design manager for BMW sports cars and she had worked at Microsoft uh, and was famous for launching Vista. Maybe not something he wants to be famous for now, but uh, it was good for our school to have people in that position. Uh, other roles that you see prominently uh, are things like designers do things which artists had done longer, but now using the language of design rather than the paintbrush, that is, using design as a means for cultural criticism, uh, like Tony Dunn. Uh, and we see a lot of uh, designers moving into fine research in the profession. And that's probably because the university design educations are starting to get sizable and connected uh, in the world. This is in Bukowski, uh, at Alto, probably now somewhere else, I don't know whether I can tell it yet. And last year he brought out a book about the new design research methods, where he studied how the new generation of designers bring new research paradigms to universities. Another thing is the design researchers in the American sense of the word, as we, in Europe we call them user researchers, who strive to understand the world of the user, um, has been growing uh, quite rapidly. We started to develop and teach these methods in 2004, and in 2009, the Professor Hissop defended her PhD. We actually had 20 of our graduate students there who had context mapping or user research as part of their job description. This really has been going very quickly now. Finally, or not finally, another thing is that Brian Tidball, American student, is trying to do use crowdsourcing uh, as ways of bringing in new internet techniques. And this is this particularly small, nice example where he used Mechanical Turk, a crowdsourcing engine, to let people bring in ethnographic insights. And he asked people from all over the world anonymously to bring in photos that showed how they were, what they were doing to live sustainably. If you do this with crowdsourcing, he, his, his hope is that you can do that for a study for five dollars rather than five thousand dollars and get good insight, different insights of course than if you do a deep study. And this is what he got back. Um, the interesting thing is, he said, at the price of five dollars, the only thing that designers usually do is Google. Google Images gets you some things. If you compare what you find, if you get this, through crowdsourcing rather than through Google Images. Google Images is entirely dominated by what companies want to broadcast. It's a dangerous source of inspiration, by the way. This is actually user-inspired. It's strange for us here, but remember 60% of the people who participate in crowdsourcing live in India. And a lot of people brought in religious images. We hadn't realized how important religion is in people's ideas of sustainability. Hadn't heard that. Is it interesting? Depends on what you're trying to do. The design facilitator is another role and is close to the user researcher. The meta designer, and that's the last big point I want to make. Daniel. Um, Besides doing his PhD research, liked enjoying uh, designing things in between. And what he made was using the IKEA lamps, created dodecahedra and other platonic solids. 
a great effect. We hung them in the studio, and we actually have one with 98 lamps in the main hall. But what he also did is he brought it into IKEA hackers and instructables. And he said, that changed my responsibilities as a designer entirely. I wanted to make instructions on how other people can make these platonic solids out of IKEA lamps. And that means you make it by cutting holes in them at regular distances, putting tie wraps through them, fitting the electricity safely, and then putting it together. And so he, he said, but now, if I want to make these instructions, and in some sense that's meta design, the designing the tools so others can make, if I want to make these instructions, I have to know what these other people have in tools. I have to know what they have in skills. I have to know what I will be responsible for, either uh, morally or lawfully, if I write a bad instruction and they didn't electrocute themselves. I don't want that on my conscience. conscience. So here you have a new set of responsibilities if you work into the instructions department, which said my education didn't prepare me for that. If you look at how design education has been talked about in the past years, I think we had a classic situation that many of the design education are still organized by product category. Automotive design, graphic design, product design, software design, systems design. And sometimes people take two branches and become a bit of a hip hybrid designer. And there have been calls for a generalist designer who can do everything. <laughs> and then there's the talk about T-shaped designers, that people who have an expertise or multiple expertises and can collaborate in teams in the entire world. It's quite important. What we're also noticing, though, is that we see the objective of design becoming important in how schools are trying to renew their curricula. And this and I see a, a trend that where we had a horizontal separation, which probably is good for the bachelor level to have people learn a coherent set of skills in depth. We notice that at advanced the objectives, the purposes of the design, value sets are becoming leading as well. So, in, sorry, my ears are too big. Uh, in designing for experience, you get people from different backgrounds. Sustainability design, designing for sustainability, also asks for people from different backgrounds. So, at some places, we see design schools changing their curriculum from product categories into these values. Other places, they're trying to make mixes of the two. Design education is also changing. So, finally, I hope I said what I wanted to say, and I think what I want to leave you with is some questions, and I don't have the real answers. Uh, and I don't expect the answers to be found. But one of the things I notice is getting more important, is initiative. Who takes the initiative and who gets to take the initiative? In the classic picture, the manufacturer thought of, we're going to make a mixer for kitchens. In the new models, you also have design agencies and designers coming up with product ideas, outsourcing production, uh, and taking the initiative there. I think in the whole Fab Lab area, there is the hope that people without a formal design education are able to take initiatives like that. The hospital example I showed of the operations theater or of someone without a design uh, training taking the lead 
in a quite a large uh, process. And I think one of the parts of the research techniques that I showed in giving people ambiguous sets and asking them to make things in order to learn are also a way in which researchers do not tell you what the questions are, but allow you to take the initiative to formulate both questions and possible answers. Who plays what part? I showed you I don't have the good names for each or either of the functions. So it's a very messy world, and we see all kinds of combinations. And I think we will be seeing a number of those. And I may have said this at the end, or at the beginning. What is it that we're designing? And it used to be simple 20 years ago, at least from my understanding, that it was, will you design a car? Will you design a table? Or something like that. With the waves of experience design, there have been a lot of discussion of, can you design an experience? Or can you only design for an experience? Because the experience is what the user makes of it. You cannot guarantee that people will have a good experience with your product. I believe that this whole list does not really separate one branch from the other. It is the choice at which level you choose to speak. It is the choice at which level your design discussions are, your goals are formulated, your vision is expressed, and which do. And I think we should have a rich spectrum in all of these areas. That's it.